percent of people are still without power. And the death toll from the storm has risen to 15 after two men died in St. Tammany. One was a 68 year old who fell off of a roof while making repairs. Now the other was a 71 year old who died from lack of oxygen during the power outages. Earlier today, the state health department shut down all seven nursing homes that evacuated their residents and staff into a warehouse. More than 800 residents were sent to that warehouse in Independence. Today, officials released new information after announcing they were pulling the licenses of the nursing homes involved. It is the opinion of LDH that all seven facilities have failed to properly execute post landfall emergency preparedness plans to provide essential care and services to their residents. Further, when LDH was making efforts to fully discover the site conditions post landfall, LDH surveyors and inspectors, instead of being provided necessary information, were prohibited by the facilities and their owner from conducting and completing on site inspections and surveys. LDH employees involved in ascertaining the safety and the welfare of residents were also subject to intimidation by an individual representing himself as a nursing home owner and providing false and or conflicting information at this time of crisis. Let's be clear, there is no emergency preparedness plan that allows for residents to be kept in such an unsafe, unsanitary and unhealthy condition. The lack of adequate care for these residents is inhumane and goes against the rules, regulations, and applicable statutes. LDH did move to rescue the residents to ensure that they received the proper care and services that they deserved. We did this by removing them from this site and working to transition them to licensed beds and licensed and certified nursing facilities that are continued uh, to be in operation. This investigation next steps will now continue to be done again in a very deliberate manner where LDH, along with our Office of Public Health and our Health Standards Section, Office of the State Fire Marshal, and our other partners in government will look at pre-landfall planning and preparedness. We will then turn and we will look at post-landfall, uh, post-evacuation, and post-transition uh, to see whether or not the facts in those two areas would lead to additional supplementation of the revocations. Just ahead of the state's announcement, they were making the rare move of revoking the licenses. We heard from the owner of them, Bob Dean. He defended his decision to relocate those residents to his warehouse. In a phone interview with our partners at the Times Picayune New Orleans Advocate, Dean said he was out of town during the storm, but he downplayed seven patient deaths and defended that evacuation plan as solid. State health officials had a very different view, saying conditions at the warehouse turned dire, as you can see in this exclusive video obtained by Channel 4 on your screen right now. Today, showing floodwater swamping mattresses on the floor. Like what kind of person would think in their right mind to store over 800 people in a warehouse? And these are not healthy people. These are people that are sick. In announcing the shutdowns, the Louisiana Department of Health said the company failed to reach out to the state for help and at one point even blocked inspectors from the building, subjecting them to, quote, intimidation. Now, previously, both the state attorney general's office and local law enforcement officials said they have launched criminal investigations into the company for its treatment of patients during the crisis. A New Orleans City Councilwoman wants immediate changes when it comes to standards and requirements for senior independent living facilities in our city. As Mike McDaniel explains, Hurricane Ida shined a light on what turned out to be a deadly gap in protection for some of the city's most vulnerable. Temporarily closed reads a piece of paper on the door of Annunciation Inn Apartments on Spain Street in New Orleans. We're quite frankly horrified. Um, at the conditions in this building. The senior independent living facility is one of nine in New Orleans forced to shut down after the city evacuated residents who were left there during and after Hurricane Ida. Five people died, one in this building. The other residents that were living here were in dire need of water and ice and food. Where the management office was, it was empty. There is just a posting on the window um, that we suggest that you evacuate, and if you don't have family, call 311. 
City Councilwoman Kristen Palmer says leaving vulnerable residents to fend for themselves is unacceptable and wants privately ran senior living facilities to be held to the same standard as nursing homes, which are regulated by the state. It gives greater ability for us to, to hold them accountable. That gap in accountability and protection led Palmer to file a proposal to require yearly inspections, evacuation plans, backup power supplies, and on-site management for storms. This is about humanity. That's right. This is about people. Queen Lassay lives in a senior living facility in the seventh ward. It didn't have to be evacuated, but Lassay says it easily could have been. She says there was no plan or management during the storm. A lot of people were screaming. We had one lady to jump out of the window and broke her leg off the second floor. Before being allowed to reopen, facilities are being inspected, six so far, revealing more problems. We have identified pretty significant deferred maintenance in all of these facilities. Uh, lots of work done without permits, um, things that really is, it's just, it's just basic building management. Management, Palmer says, must change. Mike McDaniel, Eyewitness News. Now, Palmer says she hopes to have these new requirements in place sometime this hurricane season. Several of those senior living facilities that were operate were closed rather are operated by the Archdiocese of New Orleans and Eyewitness News reached out for comment to them, but we still have not heard back. Now, in regards to that nursing home story that we told you about a little bit earlier, right now on our website, we have the 911 call logs that were made from inside that Independence Warehouse. You can find those on our website, WWLTV.com. Entergy says they're making progress in restoring power in Jefferson Parish. The goal is to have the vast majority of customers restored by tomorrow night. One thing to keep in mind, though, there may be damage to your electrical system that is your responsibility to fix before you can get your power back. But if you have some damages to your meter pan, your weather head, right where that electric service comes in, please now get a licensed electrician, have that work done, be ready for us to get the power to you so that you can accept it when we're there. You can go to EntergyStormCenter.com. Right at the top, there's a series of links. Click on the one. It's very simple. It says, what's yours? What's ours? When you click on that, there is a graphic for both overhead service. It shows what the customer is responsible for, what Entergy is responsible for, and then underground service. It shows the same thing. So that is a very informative site. Uh, please go there and find out what you might need an electrician to help you with so that you're able to take power from Entergy as quickly as possible. Well, over in St. John Parish, those in the plus are still trying to clean up after Ida hit the city pretty hard. And many of those who are there are still without power. Paul Dudley joins us now from the plus. And Paul, there is a small group of people who do have power right now, right? Uh, yeah, but not many, uh, Sheree. Such a difficult time for folks out here in St. John Parish. There is damage just about everywhere that you look, and uh, there are thousands that are still in the dark, and it does appear that folks are going to have to wait quite a bit longer before the lights come on. Across St. John Parish, the damage from Hurricane Ida feels endless. It's the two feet in the house, and um, it's destroyed the house. I'm 60, never seen a storm like this. The plaza looks like it had been hit by a bomb. More than a week after Ida, debris litters the street, left behind after the storm's punishing winds. As of Tuesday night, nearly all of the parish remained in the dark. Right now, 94% of the parish is still without power. Many neighborhoods looking like this, down power lines everywhere. That power pole snapped, um, the brown roofing. I don't know whose roof it was, but it was everywhere. When the pole came Joseph down, Haywood is one of more than 18,000 in the parish without power. Entergy says more than 2,200 poles were broken in the storm, at least 370 transformers damaged. It was like a war zone. I, I was like, I just can't believe this is my town. Total devastation. If you drive around Laplace, I mean, a, a total devastation, that's all I can say. There was a bit of hope on Tuesday when bits of the parish started to light up green on the Entergy outage map. The map showed Glenn Brown's home had power. Turns out he didn't. We asked him how he was coping with it. It just kind of a, a big burden on, on my wife because, you know, the heat and stuff. But, you know, the thing is that me, I, I'm just a survivor. Entergy says the confusion with the outage map is because of connectivity issues, which has led to delays in the power status available on the map. 
There were a few flashing lights off an of airline, the only sign of power in the parish. I did not hear anyone in this area getting power back. You know, from, you know, my friends? Nope. Crews are working throughout the parish. Entergy says they are prioritizing critical infrastructure, like hospitals and police stations. The estimated restoration is September 17th. Somehow, Haywood is finding a way to stay optimistic. I'm one that understands there's going to be setbacks and just, just deal with it and eventually we will all be back normal. Every day it gets a little bit better and we will be back. Now after crews get those critical buildings back online, the priority is going to shift to getting grocery stores and gas stations back. And after that, the energy crews are gonna be focusing on the jobs that allow them to get the most people back online at once uh, versus the ones that are not gonna allow the, uh, many houses at all. For example, if there's a job that allows them to get 2,000 customers back online, that's gonna take priority over one that's gonna just offer 200. That is the latest in Laplace. I'm Paul Dudley, Eyewitness News, back to you. Paul, thank you so much for that update. Well, 60,000 more energy customers got electricity back yesterday, and the utility says even more should be back on tomorrow. Um, Still I, hundreds okay. of thousands remain without power. I was going to say, at least we all hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Danny Monteverdi spoke to Entergy earlier, and while a lot of people are still waiting, we are seeing the first efforts to bring lights back on in some of the hardest hit areas. As of Tuesday afternoon, 25% of Entergy customers in New Orleans were without power, while 61% lacked it in Jefferson Parish. The utility says Wednesday should bring a big change. By that point, 90% of customers in both parishes should be back in business. It'll take weeks before most people in St. Charles, St. John, Terrebonne and Lafouche get serviced though. Philip May, the CEO of Entergy Louisiana, says that as work wraps up in places like Orleans and Jefferson, crews will move deeper into the hardest hit areas. In Lavouche Parish, a tiny island of power is slowly returning as the lights come back to Thibodeau Regional Medical Center. When we get that hospital on, turns out there's some apartments nearby right there at Nichols that we'll be able to get on as well. We'll get some other areas on. So if you live near the fire station, near the water treatment plant, you'll probably see your lights get on early. Danny Monteverdi, Eyewitness News. Louisiana Secretary of State Kyle Ardwan is asking the governor to reschedule the fall elections because of Ida. Ardwin says there are too many questions about the condition of polling sites, poll workers, mail delivery and other issues to make sure that the integrity of the election is sound. He is proposing that October 9th election be moved to November 13th and the November 13th election delayed until December 11th. The next step is for Governor Edwards to sign off on the plan and the October ballot includes many important races in New Orleans, including mayor, sheriff and city council. We are getting a better look at the damage in Lafouche, where officials say nearly every home appears to have sustained some damage. Yeah, this includes the city of Raceland, who's not only struggling with a lack of power, but also some bad cell service. But people have come together doing whatever they can to help one another. Maria Aguilera has the story. I was pretty lucky I didn't have no damage. Janice Reyes has lived in Raceland her entire life, yet she's never seen destruction like this. No power, gas running low to run generators, and lack of cell phone signal. I don't have phone service at all to get in contact with my family. Uh, some people have phone service back on, but it's, you know, very hard and we need, you know, help, you know, with food and everything. She says bigger cities have been getting more help than them. What about Raceland, Louisiana? We need all the community we can. We need all the help we can. Residents have been helping each other. And I've been cooking for the neighborhood. Linemen working around the city to fix down power lines. The National Guard providing emergency supplies. I mean a lot because a lot of people, you know, left and, you know, got a lot of people down here that don't got nothing, you know. So me, I just come through the line and just get the stuff and go get it back to the people. Some people wish they had a cold drink of water in this heat. It's good to have something cold to drink, you know. It's hard to get something cold on. All the stores closed. Many of them have one thing in common, hope. We're going to make it though. We just have to hold on, help each other, and to just ride it out. We're going to rebuild back. Raceland is Raceland. We are a close community. Well, there are some places that didn't suffer severe damage from Ida and are trying to get back to something pretty normal. In fact, one site that's been offering storm victims aid closed. Julissa Garza has the latest from Slidell. 
Recovery from Hurricane Ida continues throughout the state of Louisiana, and right here in Slidell, there are signs of a return to normalcy. This is my second stop, so I'm, I'm getting what I need. Gas available, grocery stores open, places for food open, and signs of power. These are the sights in Slidell. It's still not too much normal. The shelves don't have any food and stuff on. Half of them's empty. And gas station still got little lawns. Although normalcy hasn't fully returned, residents are glad to see things getting better. Getting better every day, so um, we're happy to see that. And the National Guard wrapping up their last distribution site. Today we saw about 740 cars. And glad to see normalcy not far away for the residents in the community. It's nice to see the power come back on. People can get stuff at Walmart now, get ice and get food and get water. Uh, so uh, people are asking for less things. And Ernest Markholm, the last car at the distribution site, able to get the supplies he needs. Feels good. Markholm, like many residents, hopeful for the future and for better days to continue. Long road for me because the roof is ripped off and the tree uh, did a lot of damage, but um, hopeful for the future. Jalissa Garza, Eyewitness News. Still to come tonight, at 10, thousands of children across the area are still not back in school. But we did get an update today on New Orleans schools when they expect students back in the classroom. And some of us got a little bit of rain tonight, so are we expecting to see that cold front to help us actually cool off? Chief Meteorologist Chris Franklin has your full weather expert forecast after the break.
We're getting a better understanding of when schools in New Orleans will be reopening, how they're arming for students to come back Saturday, or excuse me, not Saturday, starting September 15th through the 22nd. The superintendent says the timeline will depend on buildings getting power and for the teacher, staff, and bus drivers. Of the 88 schools in New Orleans, 22 were damaged, but they're confident the schools will be in good enough condition for classes to start next week. Now, so far, timelines for schools in more heavily affected parishes like Jefferson, Terrebonne, Lafouche, and St. Charles have not been announced. Parts of Plaquemines Parish or Plaquemines Parish are still under a mandatory evacuation order for those from Alliance Floodgate down to the West Bank as the parish continues to deal with flooding. Some areas like Myrtle Grove are having to get food sent into communities where residents have still not evacuated. Those who stayed are cleaning up the mess left behind. The East Bank was also asked to evacuate, but that's because of a lack of resources there. The parish president says he plans to lift that order soon, with power and water being restored to parts of the East Bank. The city of New Orleans gave an update on trash pickup since today was the first day that crews started collecting debris. City infrastructure leader Ramsey Green reminded people only to pile debris between the curb and the sidewalk and not to block any rights of way. He says it could take weeks to finish because there is just so much out there. Green urged people to have patience and understand that regular trash pickup is going to be slower. Green emphasized that pickup is going much slower because of just how much waste there is across the city. Had some scattered showers, thunderstorms around the area. Most of those are gone. Still a few little isolated showers kind of popping up offshore, but inland we're dry and dry through the overnight. But rainfall totals wasn't everywhere, at least in terms of the heavy downpours. Got some good soaking up in Slidell, approaching an inch of rain, half inch downtown. And at times it comes down fairly heavy, but then only reported about a hundredth of an inch at Bell Chase and a little more than that out in reserve. Fewer showers expected during the day tomorrow and a lot a lot of it may be a little bit more focused offshore and along the coast, but notice a few popping up inland, but probably not going to last for too, too long. Rain coverage is a bit lower tomorrow, and then by Thursday, we are looking at a dry day and a welcomed dry stretch of weather, not only in terms of the rain, but the humidity will be coming down. A lot more lights looking across both the West Bank and East Bank toward downtown. Good news. 80 degrees, our current temperature with a dew point of 75. That's the number to watch over the next several days because that value will be falling and a better feel air will be settling in or better feel air will be settling in. We're in the 70s, low 80s outside at the moment, but that dry air is also going to help to do is allow for those evening and morning temperatures to get a little bit cooler. Not quite yet. It's going to be hot and humid tomorrow and another heat advisory is in effect. Not that we're expecting excessively hot temperatures, but just the lack of air conditioning and so many folks outdoors use caution. So fewer storms tomorrow and a hotter day. Then that dry air moves in for Thursday. We are still keeping a watch of our invest in the Gulf, but does not look like it's going to be impacting our weather at all. Upper trough is starting to deepen and dive southward. What that is going to help to do is twofold. One, it's going to help to bring down that drier air and two, whatever invest 91 tries to do, at least in terms of developing that trough is going to kick it away from southeast Louisiana that pushes off the east coast and that dry pattern settles in for the rest of the week. And as we head into the weekend, look at the dew points. What are normal this time of year are more low mid 70s. That's our typical early September mugginess. As we head into Thursday morning, those dew points are already starting to fall into the 60s. By Friday morning and into Saturday, dew points will be in the 50s. That drive and air mass and clear skies will allow temperatures to drop into the 60s and likely looking at low 60s on the North Shore. So some very, we'll call it almost fall like weather. Front deepening southward that is going to take our invest or maybe it is Mindy at that point eastward and away from us probably not even going to see any rainfall from that and as the front sweeps on through we clear out and turn very pleasant now the percent chance for development has increased by the National Hurricane Center to a 50 percent chance but what's interesting is that was kind of based on the fact that the models were turning a little more aggressive but also it started to get a bit more organization and that's a loose term the thunderstorms were starting to really develop across more centralized areas opposed to just kind of 
of all over the Gulf where it was yesterday. But notice, when we colorize those cloud tops, there really isn't anything getting any organized at the moment. So it's going to be a slow process. We'll see what happens tomorrow. But again, regardless of development, that system is moving away from us. And remember, we will then be on the dry side. We need to be on the dry side of this. And so our weather is going to be just fine from whatever forms. And as I just mentioned, the next name up is Mindy. Larry is still a monster of a storm, but thankfully not affecting land. Might see some high winds in Bermuda, but not a direct landfall, thankfully. 30% chance for some showers, warm or hot, humid, our typical early September day. And then that drier air starts moving in. Afternoon highs more into the 80s, and our morning lows is when you'll really feel the difference. We're looking at 60s and then probably staying in the 70s in the metro area. Well, we are hoping our New Orleans teams can eventually make their way back home with Tulane still practicing in Birmingham and the Saints in Dallas. But they're making the best of their situations and looking to turn the page next week. Here from Tulane, LSU and the Saints coming up next in sports. Man, what a start to the football season for the Tulane Green Wave, taking it to the second ranked team in the country, almost knocking off Oklahoma. But don't tell them that. Willie Fritz and company are not viewing the 40 to 35 loss as some sort of moral victory. They expected to win and honestly could have if it weren't for the three fumbles and one questionable pass interference call. Coach Fritz was asked if it bothers him getting praise after a loss and he says it does. His players echoed the same as they now turn their attention to an FCS opponent in Morgan State. Their mentality remains unchanged. Realizing that this is a college football team, you know, no matter what level, no matter what conference they're in, 
they're going to come in, they're going to compete, you know. Middle people look down on us last year when we were in Oklahoma. And, you know, Great ball like skills, getting you know, Tulane to flip it off the field right now. And we don't want to do that. Let me ask you guys, why, why would you, know, you go for two here? You don't have to go for two yet. Uh, great athletes on, you will on the uh, offensive side of the ball, line. speed guys. You know, we, we don't want to take this thing like that. And a huge interception to get the great way started on the road here at Norman. Outstanding job by Kennedy. Over in Baton Rouge at Ogeron and his LSU Tigers face a unique matchup this week. Ogeron will go head to head with his son, Cody, the starting quarterback for the McNeese State Cowboys. One of the last times this happened in college football history was when John Elway, who played for Stanford, faced his dad, Jack, at San Jose State. Well, his dad upset his son's team 35 to 31 in 1982. Coach O hoping his son doesn't upset LSU as they look to rebound from an ugly loss against UCLA. Yeah, it, it is challenging, uh, but I'm a coach the way I know how to coach. And uh, I, I mean, I may uh, tone down a couple of words I use because it is my son. But besides that, uh, Cody knows we're coming, man. Hey, we, we, we're hungry. We have, we have this station in our belly, and we're coming, and Mike Neeson's on our way. He understands that. I'm looking forward to it. You know, uh, Bobby April is a mentor of mine. He said, man, enjoy this. This is a special moment, and it is. And for me to be the head coach at LSU and for Cody to be the quarterback at Mike Neeson, us to play together, uh, that just he called me today. He said, hey, Dad, I, I, I want to get four more tickets. Can you help me with tickets? <laughs> Love the competition brewing in that household, but also expect to see quarterback Garrett Nussmeyer and running back Corey Kiner hit the field this weekend to get some reps under their belt. Meanwhile, the Houdat are trying to make themselves comfortable in Dallas as they prepare for week one against the Green Bay Packers. Saints general manager Mickey Loomis joins WWL radio tonight and says they are developing a routine in the Lone Star State. He also mentions the front office explored Dallas, Houston, Tennessee and other venues for game one. Ultimately, though, landing on Jacksonville as the best site. We also got into roster management and the move releasing running back Latavius Murray. Yeah, they're really tough, and, and uh, Latavius is such a great teammate and, and uh, contributed to a lot of wins for us uh, over the last uh, a couple of years. And, and uh, you know, I just can't say enough good things about Latavius, and, and uh, obviously we wish him well. And, and look, you never know. You never know what the future holds. He's, you know, he's, he's got a lot of football left in him, and, and uh, we just wish him the best. Yeah, interesting that he left the door open there for Murray, but I think this move should also pose as a good sign for Tony Jones Jr., who has really emerged this preseason. That's going to do it for sports. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
And that's our news for now. Thanks for watching. Have a great